Psychiatrist Dr. James is summoned on the eve of a serial killer's execution to determine whether or not he is sane enough to face the electric chair. The murderer claims to be possessed by a demon who has chosen James to tell his story. Strange things happen in this killer knows personal things about the doctor, which convinces him there just may be a demon pulling the killer's strings. Is this killer really possessed? Or is it just an act to get what he wants? Break out the holy water and let's find out. Psychiatrist Alan Fisher signs a document just before leaving his office. Moments later, he's falling from the roof. In Oklahoma, Edward Wayne Brady is about to be executed after 11 years on death row. Dr. James Martin arrives for the psychiatric evaluation of Brady. He has replaced Dr. Fisher. The warden just wants the psychiatrist to just sign that he's faking his possessed by the devil routine. The inmate is a master manipulator, so the warden warns James to not get fooled into his act. In the interview room, as James introduces himself, Brady knows all about him and recaps his entire resume. The psychiatrist explains what the evaluation is for, but Brady interrupts saying that once he's dead, they'll do an autopsy. He asks why when they know he died from electrocution. Brady then confesses that Fisher made the horrific decision because he made him do it. Dr. James asks him why he wanted Fisher dead if he signed off on him undeserving of a death sentence due to insanity. Brady reports that he wants Brady to die and he has chosen James to become the author of his story. Brady tells him he can't die because he's a demon just using Brady's body as a suit. Ah, okay, so it's demon talk. Got it. James asks his name, and Brady tells him that his real name was common 3,500 years ago, but sounds like gibberish now. So he tells James to call him Nefarious, close enough to the meaning of his real name. When the doctor tells him Nefarious isn't a real name, the demon gets defensive, exclaiming that names have power, then calls his psychiatrist Jimmy, which startles him. Nefarious laughs and says he has a secret, then tells James that before he leaves here today, he will have committed three murders. James scoffs at this and tells him he would rather discuss the murders he's committed. Nefarious confesses that over the last few thousand years, he's committed many murders. James urges him to stick to the killings Edward Wayne Brady was found guilty of. He tells James that Brady didn't commit any murders. He only served as a puppet to execute Nefarious's homicidal proclivities. And he loved doing it. James asks how he came to possess Brady, and Nefarious explains that the process is gradual. It starts with the accumulation of bad choices, the old angel devil on the shoulders, and a moral axe. The host's body goes through degrees of temptation, subjugation, and eventually possession. Finally, a demon owns the body. Brady's body is no longer needed. Nefarious wants to be free of it so Brady can go to hell. James radios in for a chaplain, since religion is not his forte. James claims to be an atheist, but Nefarious screams that being a non-believer won't protect against his evil powers. A light bulb shatters. Coincidence? Father Lewis arrives. Nefarious freaks out. He's afraid, it seems. The priest tells him demonic possession is impossible, and he only came to ease his fears. Nefarious says, Oh, thank you. I feel much better now. You've really cleared things up. Nefarious goes to shake his hand, but the priest pulls back. He calls him Weird Lou and taunts him. Nefarious tells him the priest is a hack, a poser who did nothing for him. James asks the prisoner to prove to him that he is a demon. Nefarious says, okay, let me possess you. James agrees, but only if he promises to let Brady through afterwards. James opens his arms, telling him to go for it, then mocks him when he doesn't feel any different. 
Brady is now speaking, and much slower, and with a stutter. James asks him if he is familiar with dissociative identity disorder. Brady says he doesn't have that. It's nefarious, making him do bad things, and he gets punished. Brady starts crying. Nefarious returns and says at least Brady didn't kill his mother. The demon goes on to give details on how James let his mother die by pulling the plug when she was old and on life support. He inherited lots of money. It wasn't death with dignity, but greed. James gets defensive saying she was in pain, but Nefarious counters with, nah, she was just becoming inconvenient. The demon is starting to get under the skin of the doctor, and James loses control. He sits down and apologizes and tells him his personal life is off limits. Nefarious agrees to stop talking about his mummy. Dr. James returns to the split personality line of questioning. Nefarious knows all about it and dismisses his questions. He tells the doctor he summoned him there to tell his story, to write a book about how the atheist psychiatrist became a believer in demonic possession after this encounter. The two start discussing theology. The demon tells James he's on to his game, trying to find a loophole in his knowledge of the demonic world. So the convict explains why the devil is really in control of the world, not God. Explaining that those who profess to be followers of God are really his slaves. However, those that follow evil have the freedom of choice. The devil is gaining more and more followers every day as more people are tempted by sin and give into it. Hmm, that does seem to be true. Have you seen his IG account? James is fascinated by this interpretation. Nefarious says the diabolical world has one goal, to destroy good men. Dr. James signs off, telling Nefarious that he truly is convinced that Brady believes he is possessed and therefore unfit for execution. He's declaring him insane, so he will be sent to a mental institution and not be put to death. As James is walking out, Nefarious tells him about his girlfriend, Melanie and how she's about to abort his son, though she's only doing it to help their relationship. But he plans to break up with her after. She'll live with regret all her life because of his selfishness. Nefarious says he can save their relationship if he apologizes to Melanie, saying he loves her. James starts engaging the demon in defense, saying it's complicated and he's not ready to be a father. The demon gives details on what is happening in her womb at that moment and how he just killed his second victim today. Yep, score another one for the devil. Dr. James is now rattled and realizes Nefarious is right. He begs the guard to let him make an emergency call to try to stop it. He calls Melanie, but he is too late. It has already been done. Brady is taken to the cell to await his execution. He stutters and orders a very specific last meal and begs the guard not to mess it up. Then as the guard leaves, his voice changes and he shouts to forget it. He's not hungry. Aw oh man, throw the guy a bone, you meanie. James is hesitant now and confides to the warden that Brady knows things about him he couldn't discover if he'd been in solitary confinement. The warden says he hasn't left it in 11 years. He's told he has an hour to decide Brady's fate. James goes back and demands to know how Brady, or rather Nefarious, knew about the abortion. Nefarious laughs and tells him he's a demon. Duh! They banter back and forth and Nefarious begins to speak Latin. He says his name is Legion, meaning there are many and they are battling against the whole human race. James defends the human race, saying literacy, anti-racism, and equality are winning. Humans are reclaiming the moral high ground. Nefarious thinks this is hysterical. He states the average high school graduate reads at a sixth grade level. Athletes making millions claim racism, and there are more slaves now than ever 
and humans did all that. Nefarious claims James to be in denial, for more humans have joined the evil side than the good. James is almost convinced. The generators are going off, and Nefarious says they are testing the electricity to make sure that Sparky is strong enough to kill Brady. Nefarious chose electrocution over the needle. He wants the cruelest way to finish Brady, and goes on to describe the changes that happen to a body when it's electrocuted. Brady temporarily returns and begs to be saved from his death sentence. James urges him to make Nefarious go away. Brady says he can't. Nefarious comes back, angry that Brady broke through. As a punishment, he breaks Brady's pinky. When James is about to radio for help, Nefarious miraculously fixes it. Brady, as Nefarious, goes into detail about the book James will write, proving evil's triumph over good. After Brady is executed, it will be a bestseller, The Dark Gospel. He's pulled away to see the warden, who shows James a journal with pictures from James's childhood. He also gives him a manuscript, naming him as the author. The decision whether or not to execute Brady is up to James. He has just one more question. Along with the warden, they speak with Brady. James demands to know how he got all the pictures and information. While he's speaking, Brady escapes. He grabs James and chokes him with the chains. Brady demands Jimmy beg for his life. He releases him and the guards beat Brady. This is all a ploy to get James to sign off on ending Brady's life. And James does. As they remove Brady, he shouts to James that this one makes three murders he's committed today. Prophecy fulfilled. James decides to witness the execution to make sure he's made the right decision. They prepare Brady, who cries and begs for his life. He asks for his last meal, and the god reminds him that he canceled it. The witnesses are warned not to cry out, and no one can leave the room until it's over. The warden reads the charges, and now Nefarious is back and laughs. In the waiting room, the detective who chased Brady for years thanks James for his decision. Brady walks untethered to the chair, crying the whole while. Once strapped in, the warden asks if he has any final words. His words are, James, do you accept my master's offer? James declines. Brady is back, scared to death as the electrocution begins. However, the doctor checks and there is still a heartbeat, so they do it again. He is declared dead two minutes later. James feels a jolt. Whispers from Nefarious enter his brain, asking him to accept his offer. He grabs a gun, saying he was wrong. He takes the gun, begs God to help him, and goes to make the mortal decision. But the bullets don't come out. One year later, James is on a talk show discussing the book he'd written. On live TV, he admits the entity possessed him as well. The gun was later checked and nothing was wrong with it. James believes it was divine intervention. He admits Brady wrote the original manuscript, but he changed it. His book is a warning to believe in the war against good and evil and choose the side of good no matter what the temptation. However, James inadvertently did what Nefarious wanted by exposing the reality of heaven, hell, and eternal life, and again leaving it up to the reader to choose what side to take. In the end, he gives money to a homeless woman, and the voice of Nefarious comes out thanking him for a job well done. So what do you think about this one? I thought it was pretty intense, but we want to know what you think in the comments below. And if you'd like to watch more from Movie Shortens, please click on the next video or playlist on the screen. Thanks for watching.